Boy, what a statement that in my sin, yes, even then, he shed his blood for me. If we have reason to be thankful today, it is to be thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, thank you for being here today. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22 as we prepare to receive the Word of God. Thank you, choir. Thank you, praise team. Thank you for what you guys do. You know, I always am trying to figure out, uh, when I read the Bible, I don't read it like a novel because it doesn't read like a novel. And when I, read like, when I read the Bible, I don't read like a magazine or a newspaper or any of those kind of things because it doesn't read like that at all. And one of the things that I really try to do is I try to put myself in its situation and try to think if I was that person or these people at that moment, what would I be experiencing? What would it be that I would be thinking at that moment? And it causes it to be much richer than I think that it is most of the time. We have grown up knowing about the crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. So for you, it would be very difficult for you to try to think of something that has not happened. But for when Jesus was talking here in Luke chapter 22, it hadn't happened yet. Not only had it not happened, but they didn't even know it was going to happen. So how difficult it would be to speak to somebody and have them tell you some things, and yet it's totally misunderstood by you. After the fact, then it's that, oh man, now I know what he was talking about. But prior to that, it's very difficult to know. So I want you to read with me Luke chapter 22 in verse 14. The Bible says this, when the hour had come, Jesus had been pushing and pushing and waiting. He said, my hour has not yet come. Well, now the hour has come. He sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for this great celebration that we have today of Thanksgiving and for this up and coming week. And we will, this will be our Thanksgiving service and we will look forward to the days to come here on Thursday. And I pray that everybody who travels will travel in great safety, but also with the opportunity to really enjoy family and friends the things that are there available to us. Help us now to celebrate your supper as it reminds us of this great celebration so many years ago in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus said that he desired to eat this Passover with a fervent desire. And he told him he would not do it again until it had been fulfilled. That was sort of a riddle. What do you mean when you're not going to eat this supper until the supper is fulfilled? Well, he was going to actually live out this supper. And so as we come today to celebrate the supper of the Lord, I want to take and also contrast it with this particular holiday. I love Thanksgiving. I think that it's one of my, one of my more favorite holidays. And I think the reason is that there's no gift giving. So we're not all pressured to go commercialize the holiday and have to spend a bunch of money. It's all about fellowship. It's all about a relationship. It's all about coming together and hanging out with each other. Even then, that creates some challenges for us. But one of the things that I've been challenged by is I've received a few, more than usual, I've received correspondence from a few people inside, outside the church, uh, mostly outside the church, that have concerns about holidays. Not, not Thanksgiving per se, but just holidays in general. And should we even be celebrating these things? If you were to go on Google holidays, whether it be Christmas, Easter, something like that, you would discover that there is a pagan holiday associated with the timing of each of our Christian holidays. And that historians will try to tell us that the pagan holidays are actually 
the origins of our Christian holidays. And they try to do that so that we as believers will somehow feel guilty about whether it's celebrating the birthday of Jesus or celebrating the resurrection of Jesus or the founding of this land or something like that. For Christmas, they will say that it is simultaneous with the holiday that honors the sun god. And so it's pagan for us to celebrate that, that the the Yule log, the Christmas tree, all those things are pagan and so forth and so on. And I understand that. And and I can appreciate when, when somebody's there. However, let me tell you why I am not bothered by celebrating Thanksgiving. And I am not bothered by celebrating Christmas or Easter or birthdays or anything else. Because I'm not. Let me tell you why I'm not. And then I'll move on. The sun god doesn't exist. There are no other gods but God of heaven. Period. Therefore, whenever a figment of my imagination establishes something, it doesn't overrule the reality of the God whom I serve. And I'm just not going to give up a day to somebody else. Because if that's what we were going to do, then if I was the devil, you know what I would do? I would establish a pagan holiday 365 days of the year, thus eliminating Christianity. But instead, I choose as a Christian to proudly and boldly celebrate the birth of my Savior. Well, he wasn't born on December 25th. Well, you don't know that he was and you don't know that he wasn't. It doesn't matter whether he was or he wasn't. He was born. And I get to celebrate it every day if I want to. So just so you know. Because I think that Christians ought to be a little bit more proud, don't you? Do you realize y'all would be flipped upside down in your beds if the whole world was celebrating the birthday of Muhammad? They're not. And they're celebrating the birthday of Jesus. And even they say, no, 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 we're celebrating Santa Claus. Yeah, but you know what it's all about. You know. Let's move on to Thanksgiving. The same people that would say that also are challenged by today about our Christian origin in the United States of America. And, you know, really we weren't established by Christians. Well, when you say that, what you're basically saying is, and I want to say this nice. What you're basically saying is that you're not interested in knowing what really can be known about history, that you would rather hear from somebody who maybe doesn't like Christianity and just take what they say that we weren't done that way, rather than go find out what could be known. It's willful ignorance. So if if that's your position, that's okay, but let me, if I may, fill in a little bit of the blanks today. Many years ago, in a land far away, overseas, there was a church. And, and when I speak of God's church, I want to speak as honorably as I possibly can because it's his bride. And I don't think we have a right to speak horribly about his church. Now, we people in the church, we are the church, but sometimes we let our stuff get mingled in and we make bad decisions. So we can talk about our bad decisions, but so far as God's church is concerned, he loves his church, it's his bride. But many years ago, there was only one manifestation of the church. When you talked about the church, it was just one church. For centuries, it was that way. And over the course of time, people in the church and leaders in the church began to take away its spiritual aspect and began to get engaged in it more physically and more humanistically. And salvation started to become, rather than by grace, it started to become by works, by sacrament, by activity, by money, by those types of things. It went on long enough that there were leaders in the church that found out and decided, this is so wrong, this is not right, this is not what Scripture teaches. And you have to realize the reason it could get off bounds that way is because not everybody contained, carried a copy of the Bible. They weren't available. It wasn't until the advent of the printing press by Gutenberg, that we actually started to get widespread copies of God's Word, which helped to bring things back into alignment. But during the course of the time when the only people that held copies of the Scriptures were the leaders of the church, and even all the leaders didn't have it, it was easy to get doctrine messed up and confused. And so the church began to go down an errant direction, and as they did, and more copies of the Bible started to become available, there were leaders in the church that said, this is not right. One particular leader was so infuriated by the way the church was going that he wrote a thesis of 95 statements that he thought was wrong with the church and he nailed them to the doors of the Wittenberg Chapel. That started what is known today as the Great Reformation of the Church. As that happened, 
uh, they, in an attempt to reform the church, we find that so often, whenever you have a large organization that goes for a long, long time, it is very resistant to change of any sort, and certainly reform of any sort. And we discovered that it was not going to happen. And so the church, even to today, has continued down that same pathway. But there were a group of people that decided, no, we can't go that way, so we're going to step outside of the church of the official state church, and we are going to actually begin to worship God the way we know that he wants to be worshipped on his own. And these were known as independents or separatists. They were separated from the uh, main church. And as they began to worship there in England, King Henry, or I mean King James I, said there was too many of these little groups that were coming about, and he said, if you guys don't come back to the church, to the state church, I'm going to harry you out of town. And so there was a group that decided, well, we don't want to raise our children and we don't want to grow ourselves up in this state church. We've discovered that it's not going exactly the right way. So we're looking for a place that we can go. Well, there was a place called Holland that was out from under the influence of that state church. And so they decided to move their entire congregation to Holland to worship. And as they did that, they discovered that even the state church, and even when it's not exactly perfect, and even when it's not doing just right, still has major characteristics uh, societally that helps for morality and integrity and character and safety and all those types of things. Because when they went to Holland, they discovered that having no influence of God resulted in very debaucherous styles of living. And that type of living was beginning to influence their children. And as it influenced their children in a very negative way, they decided they were going to relocate the church again. Now, church relocation is very difficult. Here, and, and I want to give a disclaimer before I say this, this is not on my plan. This is an illustration only. There is no sense of truth in it. I'm just using it as an illustration, okay? So everybody heard that? Did y'all hear that? Okay, so you won't call me back and say, pastor's relocating the church. I am not. But imagine if I were to say, hey, we're, we're, we're sitting on a very expensive and very valuable piece of property here, 23 acres, valued right now at $15 million. And if we were to sell this property, we could move down the road a mile and a half and buy more property at a much discounted price, and we could build buildings and do all kinds of stuff, and it would be very, very profitable to do. How difficult would that be for a congregation to relocate a mile and a half down the road? It would be very difficult. Because it would be, we've been here for a long time and all those kind of things. And I agree with all that. So, but imagine if I came to you and said, I want to relocate you to a different land. To a new world that right now doesn't even exist. And he convinced his congregation to move. These people were known as pilgrims. There were a little over a hundred of them. And so they decided, yes, we're going to move our church. We want to go to a new land where there is no influence of, of debauchery, where there's no influence of religion whatsoever. We want to freely worship God that we want to worship God. And so they found that there was a charter going, the Mayflower, and they found themselves being able to get on the Mayflower. On the Mayflower were also 60 other men that were sailors and tradesmen and otherwise that they could get them there because these people were just, they were, they were not sailors. And so they hitched a ride on the Mayflower, and as they come over onto the Mayflower, the pilgrims were a church congregation. They weren't just Christians. It was a congregation. A whole church got on the boat and came over here. And as they came over here, they were supposed to land in Virginia, but the storm, it was stormy during that time, and they got pushed up to Massachusetts. And what is today known as Massachusetts, and they landed in Plymouth. And ultimately, they knew that they weren't supposed to be there, so they tried to, when the, kind of everything cleared, they tried to sail back down to Virginia. They could not do it. And as they just decided to stay there, there was controversy during the trip across. Could you imagine a two-month journey from England to here, and you're not on a cruise ship. You're on a boat that has no plumbing, no electricity, no restrooms, uh, it's, it's packed to the gills with stores so that you have food to eat whenever you're coming across. It's been a very difficult journey. And, and people that were on there said, you know, when we get over to this new land, there's not going to be anybody there to tell us what to do or how to live. And we're just going to live our own way. And they said, we don't really want that because we'll all die if we do that. So they put together what is called the Mayflower Compact. This is, all, this is in history, but historians don't seem to want to tell you this today. In the Mayflower Compact, the first words are, in the name of God. This is why they sailed across and they gave their purpose. And here was their purpose. For the glory of God 
and to expand the kingdom of God into this new world. That's why they came across. Now, that's not why the sailors came across, but that is why the pilgrims came across. And as they began to come and they they established themselves into this land and they they ultimately just stayed because they felt like, and there's other writings that tell us, that as they tried to come down to Virginia and could not come, they decided that it must be the the providence of the hand of God for them to stay there in Massachusetts. And they decided that that's exactly what they were going to do. And so as they stayed there, realizing that these were tradesmen, not farmers, not agriculturalists, they were not fishermen, they were not hunters, they didn't know what to do. And they also were not prepared for the harshness of the winters in Massachusetts as opposed to what they were accustomed to in their homeland. So over that winter, nearly half of those pilgrims died. When they made it, the ones that made it through were trying to figure out they'd been there four months. They did not know how to catch fish or anything. They had caught one carp in four months. That's some bad fishing right there. Well, uh, an Indian stumbled onto this settlement. His name was Samoset. Samoset was an unusual guy in that he was an English-speaking Indian. He had been in league with some of the traders, the foreign traders that had made their way over and were trapping and trading stuff, and so he learned the English language. When he met these pilgrims and began to make a relationship with these pilgrims, he realized that they had needs that he himself could not help them with, but he knew somebody who could. And so he went and he got one of his friends and another Indian came in. His name was Squanto. Squanto was probably one of the most significant figures that we ought to pay major homage to for this nation exists primarily as a result of what he did for those pilgrims. And I liken Squanto to Joseph of the Old Testament. Why? I want you to think about Joseph for just a second in the Old Testament. Joseph was a young man. And he had brothers that, you know, they threw him into a cistern and he was ultimately put in prison. He was put in Potiphar's house. He was thrown in prison. He made his way to the the Pharaoh in Egypt. And over a long period of time through imprisonment and challenge and struggle, he was made prepared and ready to be second in command in Egypt so that when God decided to plant his nation in womb, in utero, so to speak, in Egypt through those 12 boys, there was Joseph there to make sure that they, had, they knew how to navigate through that land. And God used persecution and trial and struggle and all those things in Joseph's life to make that happen. Squanto was an Indian who, just a little over a year previous, had been captured by some of these foreign traders and captured as a slave. They brought him back to Spain. When they brought him back to Spain, they were teaching him the English language so that he could be a useful slave. Well, ultimately, a monk rescued Squanto. And in rescuing Squanto, he taught him the Christian faith. And historians tell us that Squanto himself professed faith in Jesus Christ. Well, he made his way back to his homeland, back here to the Americas a year later, the 1620, because the pilgrims were here in 1621. And he, when he got back, he discovered that his entire tribe had been killed. He was the last of these, this particular Indian tribe. So he could have been very revengeful and angry and mean, but when Samoset brought him back to these pilgrims, Squanto came, and instead of being uh, full of vengeance, he chose to offer them help. He taught them how to fish. He taught them specifically how to catch carp. He taught them how to plant corn, how to plant corn in a fish so that it would, you could put them wherever you want to and they would prosper. He taught them how to hunt, how to farm, how to build, how to be protected, how to handle the winters. He taught them everything there was to learn to survive in this land. Literally, it was Squanto that guaranteed the freedom that we enjoy today. He was one of God's helpers during that time, Squanto and Samoset. And after their harvest season, after being able to actually plant this stuff, because they didn't know what they were doing, but with all that help, when they planted all this, and on their first harvest, it was so massive. And they recorded how God blessed them and the providential hand of God was on them and they thanked the Indians. And so when they had that major feast, they decided, and this one happened to take place in December through a lot of legislation and stuff. It ended up in the fourth Sunday in, in September or, or November. But this first one was in December. They got everything together and they said, we want to come and have a feast to pay homage to the God of heaven and his sovereign hand that has prospered our journey over here and has watched over us and kept us safe. And allowed us to look forward into this new land. And for our new friends, the Indians. And specifically Samoset and Squanto. Who allowed, who actually forged a peace treaty. Between the Indians. That they might come together. 
And on that first Thanksgiving feast, which they didn't call it Thanksgiving then, we have subsequently looked back, but it was because of giving thanks. That was the model for what this holiday is all about. So for those who would say that we have no Christian moorings or beginnings, I would say to you, go study your history. I would say to you, understand it is beyond a Christian influence. It is a Christian origin that God established this land. And we ought to be grateful for that. And I realize that today it's just not unpopular, but still, we haven't lost anything. We should be grateful. And one, and one of the reasons that I love Thanksgiving is that those pilgrims, what did they have to give up to be here? They had to give up their homeland. They had to possibly give up their lives. They didn't know if they were going to make it on a boat across the water to places that nobody had ever seen, a treacherous journey, uh, new land, diseases. Who knows? No doctors here, no hospitals here, no civilization here. They had to give up to get something. And in the Lord's Supper this morning, I think that Jesus models that for us to help us to realize that we have to give up to get and that he would have to give up to get something. Jesus desired to eat this Passover with these guys because on this particular Passover, this was the one. Today is November the 24th. Four days from now, an astrological event will take place in our solar system that has never taken place before and that will never take place again. There is an asteroid or a comet, I'm sorry, a comet called Ison that is going to pass by the sun. It's going to pass pretty close. It is the brightest comet that uh, we have knowledge of that ever passed through our solar system. You should be able to see it at night. You could probably see it tonight if you were to know where to look. You go on the internet, Google it, you find out where to look. But it'll pass by on the 28th, which is four days from now. It passes by on the beginning of Hanukkah. It is the first astrological sign in a series of astrological signs that will take place between now and 2018. And this is the first time since the time of Jesus Christ that these particular astrological symbols and signs are going to take place in the heavens that align with the Jewish feast days and Jewish holidays. A, tet a tetrad, a four, a four blood moons that will happen on these particular things over the course of these four years that are... Uh, perfectly in alignment. There are situations that go in the constellations of the heavenlies that are, and the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and they declare all these other things. And God tells us in these times that the heavens will tell you exactly what's getting ready to happen. There are things, and it starts four days from now. Four days from now. It starts. And it's undeniable. Will the Lord be returning? I don't know. Nobody knows. But I got to tell you, this isn't going to happen again for a long, long, long time. Wouldn't it be awesome if like Jesus, when he sat down a couple of thousand years ago and he said, I have desired to have this Passover because he'd had several Passovers before, but he said, this is the one I've desired to have with you. And here's why. He says, I've desired to have this Passover because on this one, I will not have another Passover with you until the Passover has actually been fulfilled. Now, they, they didn't know what he meant. They didn't have any idea what he meant. But he said, something's going to be fulfilled here. And Jesus knew that his death would result in our life. He knew that the fulfillment of it was coming, that for all the suffer, all the struggling, for all the wondering, for all of the hoping that this was the one. Could you imagine? Now, we know that nobody knows when the Lord is coming, and so we can't necessarily predict when it's going to be, but he did say we shouldn't be caught unaware. But nevertheless, could you imagine if I were to tell you this morning, hey, guys, I was talking to the Lord this morning, and he told me that he wanted to meet y'all outside. So the doors are getting ready to open. Let's walk out. We want to meet him outside. He's coming. I just want you to know that this is the day. Would that be awesome? Now, it's not going to work that way because he doesn't allow us that. But on this night, on this night, Jesus said, this is the Passover. And so he, he took 
the elements of the Passover, which were basically typical elements of their typical meal, their Passover meal. So it wasn't unusual to them. They had been doing this since the time of the exodus from Egypt. So it's a very customary thing. It would be like today if you put up a Christmas tree or if you put up a wreath or if you have a pumpkin pie or something. No big deal. We have a pumpkin pie all the time, right? Or we have turkey all of the time. Now, on their, by the way, on the first, uh, the first Thanksgiving meal back there with Samoset Squanto and the pilgrims and the other Indians, they had also, there was a couple of other things because you know they were up in the area of Massachusetts, Maine, those areas. They had shellfish and lobster. So lobster would be an awesome Thanksgiving meal. It would be very historical. Mom, if you love lobster. <laughs> she just said sorry. So Jesus said, though, he's trying to tell them what's going on. He says, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. They had no idea what he was talking about. So far as they were concerned, the Messiah was going to come, establish his kingdom, rule and reign forever. There was no thought of a crucifixion, a death, a burial, or a resurrection in their thought. And yet Jesus says, this is the one, this is the one. And the reason it is, I want you to know something, guys. Before the next one, this will have been fulfilled. And this is my body, which has been broken for you. Take it and eat it. Why would Jesus say to eat it? It has to be personalized. It has to be internalized. You have to receive him personally and individually for this to happen. And then he said, he took the cup. Because whenever he was showing his body, it was representative of the fact that he was going to be tried. He was going to be beaten. He was going to be brutalized. But he had to make sure that they understood this was not going to be a tragedy in his life that he would eventually heal from. He had to let them know that it was going to go further than that, that he was going to go the entire way. And as he held that cup in his hand, he made this statement. He said, this cup is the new covenant which is in my blood. Now, I want you to understand this, that these were a covenantal people. They understood covenants. They recognized what it was. They knew what the covenant that God made with Adam was. We call it the Adamic covenant. They knew the Noahic covenant, the covenant made with Noah. They were familiar with the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant made with Abraham. They knew of the Davidic covenant, the covenant made with David. They knew of the Solomonic covenant, the covenant God made with Solomon. They knew of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant God made with Moses. And he had spoken of a day, a coming day, that there would be a new covenant that would supersede the covenant of Moses, that it would wipe it away and that what was exterior at one time, the law, would become interior, that he would take the law of God and that he would write it on our hearts and in our minds and that we would no longer need this exterior anymore. And it was called the new covenant. And on that night, Jesus said, this is it. This is the new covenant. He knew that he was giving them something brand new. He knew that their life would never be the same from that day forward. He realized that their life under law, their life under rule, their life under parameters was getting ready to change. And there was going to be a coming of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know that. There was going to be a forgiveness of sin that was wiped away forever. They didn't know that. There was going to be a resurrection to brand new life. They didn't know that. But he knew that what he was giving was totally brand new. And he says, it's as simple as saying, as simple as understanding that this cup represents the blood that I'm getting ready to shed for you. And it is the new covenant. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of him. Not me, not this church, but of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Take and drink. Jesus knew that we were, I think this is one of the major things that we should learn from this supper. There's a transition that happens in life. There's always transitions. They happen on occasion. A transition is hard. 
Because you grow accustomed to doing something one way, and then there's a change. And in between doing something one way and doing something another, there's a transition. The transitions are so difficult. And Jesus knew that there had to be a transition. This transition was from death to life. And somebody had to die that death. Somebody had to. And we can get really focused on his death, and I want you to for a minute, because I want you to recognize this. When Jesus was dying to give us a brand new life, he realized that something had to die before something could ever live. And he realized that it was going to be him who was going to choose to die. But why death? Why death? I remember a circumstance in my life that is etched in my memory. It might not be my brothers here, my sister-in-law, my mom. I know my mom will remember this. I'm pretty sure my brother will. But you know that, that sometimes in life, when you're little, life is very different, isn't it? Do you remember whenever you were a little kid? Say, go back to maybe 10 years old. If you have brothers and sisters or just siblings, brothers, brothers, sisters, sisters, brothers and sisters, go back whenever you were little and you didn't realize that there were things like mortgages and car payments and congressional hearings and stuff like you were a kid. You remember those times? And you remember whenever you were at home with your brothers and sisters or your family or if you're only child, whatever, but whenever you're at home and life is just kind of cool, life is kind of neat. And you, you're, you, uh, you, you know that you're going to sit down and eat Thanksgiving, you know you're going to have Christmas, you, you know you're going to school, you just know this stuff is going on, everything's fine. But when you grow up, then as you grow up, life happens. If you didn't like your brothers, well, my brothers and I, if we didn't got mad, we just beat each other up. And then we were fine. You know, you'd still be good friends, but you'd punch each other out on occasion. And, and me and Richard punched each other out on occasion. So, but you know, we, we were okay. But then as you grow up, maybe you get married and, and different people come into the family. And before you know it, there's different places to go. Not, not because you mean to be, you don't want to hang out, but it's just that now we've got this family to go to and this family and this family and this family and this family. And sometimes you actually believe differently or you think differently. And when that happens, uh, there can be friction that goes on between somebody. Over the course of life, I think that we have opportunity at least to build more and more friction. And when we do that, our go-to move is to divide, to separate. Jesus reminded us in Genesis chapter 2, it's not good that man should be alone. So he made him a helper comparable to him. But aloneness is easy. You know how easy it is to live alone? Not that it's fun to live alone, but it's easy. You can say what you want to say, do what you want to do, believe what you want to believe, watch what you want to watch, act the way you want to act, and nobody says anything because you're by yourself. There's nobody to tell you anything. But to live with somebody is more enjoyable, but it's also more difficult because now you have to take into consideration the values and the beliefs and the desires of the other person. The most difficult of all of situations is a church. See, other organizations that have large groups of people in them, they're not that difficult because you don't have to know them, you don't have to believe in them. It's just a, it's a secular organization. But a church is different. It's not just trying to get different people together. It's trying to get them to go in the same direction. That's very challenging. And Jesus knew that when you put people together with a variety of belief systems and a variety of behaviors the way that we have, there's a potential for conflict. In my father's life, he had a brother, who was my uncle, and they had a conflict one time. I'll never forget this conflict because it was over a battery charger, an automobile battery charger. So it was a fairly decent sized battery charger. And it's a battery charger. But they had a conflict over it and it caused great stress in their life. And I'll never forget the day that my uncle drove into our front yard and I remember him taking that battery charger and literally throwing it at my dad off of his truck. It hit the ground and it busted and it was of no value after that. But it was like, there's your battery charger back. And of course, they were divided for a long time. And I also remember the day that I heard both of them apologize for that battery charger incident and to restore a relationship. I remember how difficult that was. And I remember thinking about that. I can even see the battery charger. It was white. I, I can just see it. And how foolish that seemed at the time, but there was so much more behind it. I realized 
that that happens over and over and over again. That many of us have battery charger incidents, don't we? Somebody borrowed your car, bumped into it or something, scratched it, didn't tell you, let you fix it, and you've carried that with you. Somebody had a harsh word, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad had a harsh word to say to you about you got married, they didn't like your spouse. And they showed a measure of disapproval, and from that day forward, you've never spoken to them again. They tried to help you raise your children a little bit, and they said something about your kids, and boy, that infuriated you. And so you just keep them away. They don't ever get to see the kids anymore. And Jesus covered that on the cross, but let me tell you something. He died. And the reason that he died is to let you know that whatever the level, whatever the depth of something that's happened in your life, he covered it all the way to death. There is nothing so weighty that he cannot repair. There is nothing so tragic that he cannot speak life into it. He's got it covered. All of us have something that has happened, something that has gone on, something that has flipped our lives inside out. Some of us can't speak to our parents. Some of us haven't for many years. Some of us have had a divorce in our life and our children have paid the cost on that. And, and so you've got children that have situations over here and over there and you, you don't feel like you can go visit. You don't feel like you can say happy Thanksgiving or something like that. And you don't know what to do. And you've carried it for a long time. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe you've lost a loved one and you really are angry with God right now that this year you lost somebody that was so significant to you and it's hurting you very badly and you don't feel you can be happy at this particular time of the year. There's all manner of things that can be. And I think what Jesus wanted us to know was this. Before there can be life, there has to be death. Something has to die in our life and then something has to be made alive. What needs to die in your life today? Have you been guilty of something and you know, you know you are, but you blame everybody around you? And in your life, pride needs to die so that you then might live. Maybe that hatred needs to die so that you could live. Maybe, maybe your jealousy needs to die. Maybe your insecurities need to die. Maybe something like that needs to die in your life. And Christ died so that you could let it die. But a secondary question, what needs to come to life? What needs to be resurrected in your life? Why was Jesus so desirable of this Passover? Because he knew that it wasn't just his death that he was going to get up from the dead and he was going to offer you life. What needs to come alive in your life again? When was the last time you had great joy? I was at my mom's house just the other day, a couple of days ago, yesterday. Was it yesterday? No, it was day before. It was Friday. It was Friday night. I was at my mom's house and she went and got some um, comic strips and we were reading some comic strip stuff. And I was telling her a few jokes, and we were just there just laughing. And, and I mean, just really kind of that uh, guffaw kind of laugh, you know, that big belly kind of laugh thing that was going on. And I don't remember the last time, with my mom specifically, that I just sat around and just laughed. Just, just really, really enjoyed a good laugh. When was the last time you enjoyed a good laugh with someone that you used to? but you haven't in a long time. And you would say to me, well, there's not much to laugh about anymore. I want you to put to death that negative spirit. That's what I want you to do. I want you to put to death that negative spirit. I want you to put to death that depressive spirit. I want you to put to death the words that you say to yourself or the others that say to you that tell you you can't. And I want you to resurrect the spirit of hilarity in your life. The spirit of love in your life for somebody else. The spirit of joy. When you get married, in my automobile, I have a little monkey. I've given many of you this little monkey. It's called a love monkey. It's a Montevideo monkey, and it's there for romance between husbands and wives that we pass them back and forth. And my wife gave me my monkey 
whenever I was on my last trip. So I set it on the dashboard of my car. And every time I drive down the road now, I see that little monkey there smiling at me. He mocks me sometimes. And I think about that little monkey. And I think about how much my wife loves me because she gave me that little monkey. And I have opportunity to, to do things for her that she loves. Now, for me, it'd be like no big deal. My wife is not a touchy-feely kind of a lady, but she does enjoy acts of service. So it, this, is, this, is, this is small, okay? I mean, the, the five love languages, right? There's five. One of hers is acts of service. So she forever gets upset whenever we have bottles of water in the refrigerator if, if we keep pulling them out, and she always has to stock up the water. And she doesn't mind stocking up the water, but you'd think that maybe on occasion we'd do it. So I was riding home the other day, and I saw that monkey. And I thought, you know, I walked past this, and I knew that I'd taken the bottle of water out, and there was like two left. And we usually need about 35, otherwise we could die. So you've <laughs> got to have those in there. And there were two left, and I thought, I took that water out there, and I know I need to put it in, but I really don't feel like putting it in. What a bum. So then I, I said, no, I, I, I got the water. up. I said, this is for my bride. This is for my bride. So I put that water in there, and I got it all stocked up, got it all in there. She don't say anything to me about almost anything. But she said, did you put that water in the fridge? <laughs> I did. Yeah, 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 that was me. That was me. Now, she really appreciated it. Uh, I didn't get that cocky about it, but. She really did appreciate it because that was something that I could do that would put, li put life in her. When was the last time that you actually did something for your spouse in hopes of getting nothing in return other than to see their joy? You think you could resurrect that in your life? I think you could. When you sit around the Thanksgiving table, you don't have to make a big deal but yeah, it's easier for you to sit in the other room and not talk to anybody. Wouldn't it be better if you just got together and just talked? I know when we get together, well, there's so many places to sit, it's hard to sit with everybody. But we generally reminisce a little bit, and, and I enjoy seeing my family together as much as I can. Could you resurrect that again? Have you already made plans not to go somewhere, not to be with somebody, not to do something this year? Have you already made plans to do that? Could I ask you to kill that and resurrect something else? It's up to you. But I think that God would be pleased. He died to give you life. Live it. Live it. Live it like he wants you to. We're going to do the invitation a little bit differently today. The invitation is this. These altars are open. If you have something that you know needs to die in your life, just bring it up here and lay it down. Spiritually, just lay it on the altar and leave it there. God will clean it up after you're gone. If you have something in life that needs to be brought back to life, come here and pick it up. If you want to talk to one of us or pray with one of us, we'll be lined up here and we'll be here to help you. If you need Jesus, come speak to one of us. We'll be glad to help you with that. I'll step off the platform in just a second. Our praise team is going to sing. And when I step back up here, that means that you're, you're free to go. I'll have a couple of things to say, but, but our invitation is going to continue on. That if you want to stay up here, you want to come up here, you want to talk to somebody, you want to pray with somebody, we're going to stay here. They're going to continue to sing, but you'll be dismissed. It's okay. You can walk out in the music. That's fine. What we don't want to do is hinder what sometime people may need up here because of trying to close out the service at a particular time. So we want to open up our invitation a little bit more. If you need to spend some time up here, spend all the time you want to up here. If you need to talk to us up here and spend extra time, spend extra time with us. The rest of you are welcome to go when that time comes. But do business with God before you leave today and love Him. Stand with me. Father, I want to thank you today. Thank you that I was brought up in a Christian nation, a nation founded upon the sovereign of this universe, which is you and you alone. Thank you, Father, that there were those that came long before me or my family that were bold keepers and proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which ultimately came to me and my family, for which I am forever grateful. Thank you, Father, for Samoset and Squanto, who, from my understanding of history, are there with you now. 
Thank you for those early pilgrims and for every other person that came to this nation and kept her strong. Thank you, Father, for an amazing church that stays strong through the weathers, through the winds, through the rains, through the floods, through the changes and the transitions that we have here that still stay strong and still love. For we understand how difficult it is to be in a relationship with a large number of people that that means that many of us have to bend. Thank you for a church that has remained strong throughout all the transitions, has not only remained strong, but has remained very gentle and very loving. Thank you for our many volunteers who week after week after week allow us to be in this sanctuary. They park us, they watch our children, they teach us in Sunday school, they seat us when we come in, they greet us with a smile, they provide us with a bulletin, they take care of us. They watch over us. Thank you for the many, many people who give so much to make this place a reality. Thank you for my staff who has remained strong and faithful over the many years that we've been here. Lord, most of all, thank you for Jesus and thank you for this amazing supper that purchased our freedom, that purchased our forgiveness of sin and our freedom to live. I ask you, Father, would you convey upon all of these that are here life. Put in their mind that life is good. Death is what is bad. Life is what is good. If there are circumstances and situations that have divided us and even caused hardship, the Apostle Paul reminded us that as much as depended upon us, we ought to live peaceably with all men. Empower us to be the peacemakers. You told us, blessed are the peacemakers. And so, Father, help us to do that. And let this holiday season be one where we acknowledge that you are the reason for this season as well and the coming Christmas season. May we celebrate that. For those who need now prayer, our altars, our hand of fellowship, whatever it may be, draw them to us now and allow us to help. For we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.